Good morning. When we come to this room, we may possibly be a hundred or more different people. We might be likened to a hundred branches of a tree, a hundred branches of the tree of life. each separate from each other, each independent of each other, and in some cases even separate from the tree of life which is God, separate from the source. But by uniting in meditation We unite in God and in each other. We come together as branches of the tree of life, but connected with the tree of life, and by virtue of the fact that we are connected with the vine, we are also one with each other. Whatever of truth flows from the Father, the tree of life, through the vine, the Christ, to any one of us reaches each one of us. Whatever degree of spiritual light is given unto any one of us automatically is given unto all of us because of our union with the source and thereby with each other. It is for this reason that we have been taught that where two or more are gathered together or that ten righteous men can save a city. Not ten separate men combining their human knowledge or strength, but any number of individuals uniting in God, uniting in consciousness, in uniting with the source, becomes a power, a light, a strength. When we unite in meditation, whether there are two of us or more than two, whenever we unite in meditation, we unite for no selfish purpose and no personal purpose. We unite only that we may have fellowship in God, that we may unite as brothers and sisters of the household of God, a spiritual family united in God consciousness so that we may be heirs but joint heirs, that we may jointly share in all of the blessings that flow from the Godhead from the infinite divine consciousness to individual expression as you or as me. We cannot unite in meditation too often. The more often we unite in meditation, the more we are bringing ourselves into conscious union with our source, into conscious at one or oneness with the waters of life, the bread of life, the staff of life.
we unite to receive God's grace. Not that I should receive God's grace and not you, not that you should receive God's grace and not I, but that we might jointly receive God's grace. And to what end? Not that I may selfishly benefit, or not that I alone may benefit, or you, or we, or no. When the grace of God is received in your consciousness and mine, it is not something static that is embodied somewhere within our frame. It is a light that permeates us and flows out through us and from us. And since there are no barriers to the activity of spirit, this light which we have received in our union with our source flows out through these walls and windows into the world and becomes a leaven. Somewhere, anywhere, where an individual is raising their thought to God, regardless of what concept of God they may entertain. It may be a paganistic concept of God, a Hebrew or a Christian concept of God, a an oriental concept of God of any one of the oriental thoughts, but regardless of what concept of God an individual entertains, whether they be in a hospital, a prison, an institution, or whether they be walking the earth free, or in some nation where they are in slavery, if they are lifting their thought above human power, above human aid, to something in the nature of the divine, be assured that the light which goes out from us and through us because of our meditation reaches that receptive soul and in some measure lightens their burden, sometimes frees them from sin, from disease, from false appetites. It is not necessary that we consciously send our thought out into the world. In fact, it is far better that we merely unite thinking of ourselves as branches of the tree, unite with the tree, with the vine, with the source of life, and then just let it have its will on earth as it is in heaven. Let its rule and reign be on earth as it is in heaven. And wherever there is a receptive thought, wherever there is an individual who may be saying, Oh God, 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 help me. Is there something beyond the human? That soul will be touched by the Spirit of God that is now upon you that Spirit of God which is upon us because of our uniting in meditation. And we become transparencies through which this light flows to the world. We would block this if we enter meditation with any personal or selfish motive. But we come here that we may become children of God, that by our uniting in the Spirit, 
the grace of God may touch our souls, permeate our minds and body, and continue on out into blessing this world. We remember that in the world, <clears throat> which is full of darkness, there is sin, there is ignorance, there is poverty, there is slavery, bondage. And we would be the instrument through which God's grace may touch all human consciousness and enlighten it, awaken it, that all mankind may be free. There are two major steps in our spiritual life and in the first step it is those who have gone a spiritual step beyond us, let us say the teacher, who helps us with our problems, shows by example what the attained Spirit of Christ will do, helps to smooth our way by uniting with us in meditation, lifts us to a higher, deeper, richer meditation in which we too may receive this divine grace. The second step is when uh, we realize that someday the Master will say, if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. And therefore, work. Work while it is yet day. Work while the teacher is yet with you to help, to inspire, to lighten. Because the day will come when you must walk on the waters yourself. When you must live your own spiritual life and the day in which you must be dedicated, ordained that you might heal the sick, feed the hungry, bring light to the ignorant. You, no one may escape the responsibility of the Son of God. I will read from the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made 
that was made. In him was life. In him, in God, was life. And the life was the light of men. The life of God was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word was God. God is the Word, the infinite. But God sent his only begotten Son into the world, into the consciousness of men. The Word God, Spirit, became flesh, that is, became the Son of God in the consciousness of men. But the consciousness of most men was dark, so that it could not receive or believe in the Son of God. But to those who could receive, to those who had some measure of spiritual intuition and could perceive, to them the Son of God came and was received and made it possible for us, that is men, to likewise become sons of God. Now let us watch this as this takes place in your consciousness and mine. Think of yourself first as you were a human being before you learned of a spiritual message. When you thought of God as some far-off being, probably sitting on a cloud or up in heaven, when you thought of God as a sort of superhuman being, a sort of super-father who rewarded you when you were good, if he happened to notice it, who punished you when you were evil, which he always noticed. In your darkened days, when you thought of God as a sort of super Santa Claus, whom, if you could please, uh, 
would condescend to do something for you. And if you displeased, would hold you in some kind of darkness or punishment. Now think of yourself at that time, and if you can, try to remember how completely separate and apart you were from a divine influence, from a divine presence or power. How in that darkened stage you had to depend on yourself alone for your progress through life, earn your living by the sweat of your brow, study the hard way, the difficult way, go through life subject unto all of its laws, health laws, economic laws, legal laws, many of them unjust, under the domination sometimes of family and sometimes of government, depending where you lived. Think of yourself in those days with no access at all to anything of a spiritual nature that could solve your problems for you or that could be of help to you in an emergency. And then let me say this to you. At that very time, this word that was made flesh, the Son of God, dwelt in you. It was in you, but with so much darkness that you could not perceive it. You did not know that it was there. It was a spiritual darkness. It was a spiritual darkness brought upon you by an ignorance of this truth. You did not know that within you, closer to you than breathing, was this word made flesh, the Son of God, the light of the world, the creator of the world, of your world. And so you struggled by yourself with whatever measure of human wisdom you had, or whatever measure of human strength you had, or human influence or pull. Now, as you come close to a spiritual revelation, it is told you, know ye not the kingdom of God is within you? Know ye not you are the temple of God? Know you not that the Son of God, the Christ, dwelleth in you? And because you have been divinely led to this revelation, you believed, you hoped, you felt some manner of conviction. This sounds like the truth. This is what I believe or what I would love to believe, that I am not alone in the world, that God has not sent me out into this world and then abandoned me, but rather would I believe that God has placed me on this earth that I may glorify him. But how can I, in my sins, in my diseases, in my false appetites, in my poverty, how can I glorify God in that way? 
or in my struggle to survive or even just to care for my family, how can I glorify God? The answer is you can't. But if so be the Spirit of God dwelleth in you, then do you become the child of God. And if a child, an heir, joint heir to all the heavenly riches. And so your first instruction in spiritual wisdom reveals to you that you are no longer to look up into the skies that when you hear this I shall look up into the hills from whence cometh my help I will know that hills or mountains refer to those high places in consciousness the higher estate of consciousness, the higher places in my consciousness, so that when I turn to the highest sense of myself, when I turn to the Christ of God that is lifted up in me, turn to this kingdom within me, I am looking into the hills I am on that mountaintop for 40 days of communion with this Christ that is within me. Now my vision turns within and upward. Upward within me. Up into the high places of my consciousness where I will discern that the word has become flesh and dwells in me. We will learn now what happened to Saul of Tarsus on the road when in a blinding flash he is blinded to all of his ignorance to all of the past, to everything that he knew before. He can no longer see it, no longer is aware of it. And then, when all of his former beliefs have been wiped out, and he is a pure vessel, sight is restored to him but this is spiritual vision and now he knows the light is shining within me the light which is Christ is shining within me the Son of God has been raised up in me and then for about nine years he retires from the world to dwell alone with this secret, with this sacred secret. He communes with this word made flesh within him. He tabernacles with it. He learns not to live so much on the physical sense of life, not so much concerned with the physical sense of life, with the physical needs or physical wants or physical fulfillments. Now he is lifted up in consciousness and he is living mentally. He is living in his mind. He is tabernacling in his mind with this spirit that has been raised up or born in him. Born in a manger as you can see, born in a lowly mental environment, that of Saul of Tarsus, he who was humanly wise but spiritually ignorant, 
in this manger the Christ is born. And as Joseph and Mary carried the master down to Egypt for several years, so Paul carries his Christ to Arabia and hides with it for quite a few years letting it grow in him, letting it develop in him, until he himself becomes so consciously aware of it, so one with it, that gradually Paul, Saul has died, and now Paul begins to live less and less, and he lets this Christ live more and more until the day comes when the Christ can say to Paul, begin your ministry. Go out into the world and preach me. Preach to all men that I, the Word made flesh, dwell in you. Not only in you, Paul, to all those you address. Say to them, the Spirit of God dwells in you. And when your friends, the disciples, and others, try to say unto you, give this word only to the Hebrews, for the Hebrews are the chosen of God, and only they are worthy to receive this word, you will suffer their persecution. You will be tried for standing for this truth that the word made flesh dwells in the consciousness of all mankind, whether they be Jew or Gentile, whether they be civilized or pagan, you will carry to the world the universality of the Word made flesh. You will break this bondage to one religion, to one teaching, to one teacher. You will break this and reveal to all mankind that the Word has become flesh and dwells in the consciousness of all men awaiting their recognition. And Paul goes into the world of Egypt and the world of Rome, the world of Asia Minor, and he says to those of all differing religious beliefs, I bring to you the message of the Son of God. I bring to you the revelation of the Word made flesh that dwells among you as the light of the world, as the light unto your world. I bring to you the revelation that ye are children of God. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything. Ye are already the children of God. Neither fasting nor feasting availeth anything. Ye are already the children of God, for the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. This is the revelation of John, that the Word was made flesh. The Word made flesh is the Son of God or Christ, and that it dwelleth in you. 
And now you must learn its function. And Christ Jesus revealed its function on earth because he said that he came to earth to do the will of his Father. Now, he is not speaking as Jesus. He is speaking as Christ. This word that is made flesh and dwells in you is there for the purpose of doing the will of the Father. Think of this now. The Word made flesh, Christ, the Son of God, is within you. And it is there to perform the will of God. And this will, the ministry of the Master reveals, is to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to feed the hungry, to forgive the sinner, and to preach the gospel of omnipresence, of the presence of God in you. Now think for a moment that now, in this very moment, there is within you the Son of God, the Christ, and that it has a function within you to heal you, to raise you out of your dead humanhood, to restore the lost years of the locust, to forgive whatever sins you have committed in the ignorance of your true identity to forgive you the sins of omission or commission. It is forever saying to you, neither do I condemn thee. It is forever saying to you, who made me a judge over you? My function is not to judge, criticize, or condemn, but to assure you of forgiveness and to remind you that if you sin again, even worse things can come upon you because now you know the folly of sin. Now you know the stupidity of sin, and now you know something more important, that there is no necessity for sin. There is no need to lie, cheat, steal, defraud, because within you is the Son of God and hearken to the function of the Son of God. I am the bread, the meat, the wine, the water. I am the bread of life, the staff of life. This is the Christ within you speaking to you. I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Relax. Think now in your relaxed state that the voice is saying to you from within you, I am come that ye might have life and that ye might have it more abundantly. Relax. Rest. You have sought me. I was here all the time, but now you have found me. No longer is it necessary to sin. No longer is it necessary to steal. No longer is it necessary to bear false witness, to scheme, to plot, to take advantage. For I, in the midst of thee, am mighty. I, in the midst of thee, am thy bread thy supply unto eternity. I am the source of opportunity and of inspiration. I am the light unto your world. And I am come 
that ye might have life and that ye might have it more abundantly. I am the resurrection. And if your body has been destroyed with sin or disease, I will raise it up again. I, the Word made flesh, the Christ that dwells in the midst of you, I am here to raise up your body from the tomb of sin or from the tomb of disease and even from the tomb of old age. Do not even let the calendar defeat you, for I am the resurrection and I am here to resurrect you out of that old body into a body not made with hands, a spiritual body, eternal in the heavens. You don't have to go through physical death to attain this new body. Just dwell in the realization of me in the midst of you. Morning, noon, and night, ponder me, think on me, dwell in me, trust me, rely on me. Know the truth that I am in the midst of thee, and I am mighty. I am performing the function of God in you and through you. I am the mediator between you and the infinite source. I, in the midst of you, am the mediator. Those things that I receive from the Father, I bestow upon you. The gift, the grace, the strength, the healing power, the redemptive power, the forgiving power, which has been given to me of the Father, I in turn give unto you. Look unto me and be saved. Believe in the Son of God. Believe only in the Son of God and that the Son of God, the Word made flesh, the Christ, is in the midst of you. Since before Abraham was I am here in the midst of you. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Even if your parents forsake you, I will not forsake you. I will be with you unto the end of the world. I will go before you to make the crooked places straight. That is one of my functions. As the Son of God, the light, I am to light your way, to go before you, to light your way, to make the crooked places straight, and to prepare mansions for you. All of this scripture reveals is the function of the Son of God the Word made flesh that dwells among us to go before you, to walk beside you, to walk behind you. Omnipresence. So that if temporarily you are making your bed in hell, be not afraid, I am with you. If you wound up to heaven, of course, I am with you. But if you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, thou shalt fear no evil, for I, the Word made flesh, the Christ of God, am with you. And my function given to me of the Father is to heal, save, redeem, forgive, uplift, rebuild, renew, resurrect, and on the last day, ascend.
when the master, the teacher, reveals to us this truth, we then begin a most difficult part of our journey, because now we have been given the truth, the Christ has been revealed to us within us, its function has been revealed, and now comes that period when we have to make it a part of our own being, when we have to bring this truth to fruition in our individual lives. And in our work, in my particular ministry, it has been revealed to me, and I have passed it on to you, that the way to accomplish this is through the practice of the presence of God and meditation. In other words, let us say that as of this moment when this truth is revealed, we go forth and tomorrow we begin to meet with the ordinary difficulties of our human life. Here is where your function begins, because before you ever leave your home, you will have to pause for a contemplative form of meditation in which you will consciously remember this is the day the Lord hath made. God will govern it even as he has made it. And as God made all that was made, God made me, and so God will govern my day. And God will govern my night. And this word made flesh that dwells in me will be before me all day. It will go before me as a light, as a cement of relationship with all those whom I meet. This presence will go before me to prepare mansions. I will not be alone this day. I will have the companionship of the Son of God, whose mission it is that I have life and that I have it more abundantly. And then when you are out in the world and problems begin to come, again it will be necessary to turn within even for the blink of an eye and remember, he performeth that which is given me to do. He perfecteth that which concerneth me. There is this he in the midst of me, this word made flesh. There will be meal times at which it will be oh so necessary to remember, but for the grace of God there may not be a meal time, but the grace of God assures through this presence in me that there always will be a meal time, not only for me, but twelve baskets full left over for me to share with the multitudes. God's grace is never given to us only for our individual, personal, selfish purpose, but that we may have life and have it more abundantly and share it with our neighbor, love thy neighbor as thyself by sharing this grace of God. Regardless of the trials or tribulations, that face us on our human way, our recourse is to consciously remember the Word made flesh that dwells within us and its function. If I slip, its function is to pick me up again. 
If I sin, its function is to forgive me. Seventy times seven as I turn within. As long as I do not put my faith in princes, somebody out here in high human places, as long as I am not looking to man whose breath is in his nostril, as long as I acknowledge the Son of God within me as my source, as my Christ, as my resurrector, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, stayed on thee, on this word made flesh that dwells among us. Very soon, this practice of the presence becomes second nature to us, and we can hardly draw a breath without realizing that but for the grace of God we couldn't draw it. The body itself can't breathe. Do you know that the body of itself can't even stand on its feet? Did you know that a body separate and apart from consciousness collapses and falls down? Over and over it is necessary that the word became flesh and dwells in me. Then when this has become second nature to us and we cannot live a moment without a conscious realization of the function of this Spirit of God in us, we take the next step of perceiving that this is a universal truth that this neighbor whom I meet on the street, in the shop, or wherever I meet man, woman, or child, or animal, or mineral, I then begin to perceive the indwelling Christ in him, in her, in it. Then I begin to perceive that this great gift of God, which I have now discovered to be in the midst of me, is in the midst of you. Many of these do not yet know this, and you would be surprised that in our knowing it about them and for them, that it has the effect of awakening it in them you would be surprised at the amount of people who are blessed by someone passing in the throng and realizing the grace of God, the presence of God dwells also in them. Sometimes it shocks them, it awakens them. Oh, we have seen in this work miracles through some of our students out in the world silently, sacredly, secretly realizing, just think, this word made flesh that dwells in me is the word made flesh that dwells in you. Silently, sacredly, secretly, recognizing the Christ in the midst of friends, relatives, and enemies, because it is so easy to realize this in our friends and relatives, but you're not yet children of God until you can recognize it in your enemies. Personal enemies, national enemies, racial enemies, religious enemies, it makes no difference. Until you can pray for your enemies, you are not children of God not fully developed children of God, it profiteth you nothing to know this truth only for your children or wife or husband. You must know this truth for every individual on the face of the globe, being 
especially watchful to remember that you are knowing it about those who seem the most sunk in sin, disease, fear, ignorance. When the full significance dawns upon us of the meaning of the Word made flesh that dwells among us on this earth, and that it is the mediator between God and man, and that we have this mediator in our consciousness, we have this presence and power of mediation, and therefore all that the Father intends for us individually to have is ours by the grace of this realized, raised up Son of God in us. Do you see why the practice of the presence of God is so essential? Let us go further and say that without it, we will not attain the conscious awareness of the presence of God. And then this continued practicing of the presence of God leads to an inner silence, an inner stillness, so that when we sit down, the turmoil of the world does not enter in, and then we find ourselves in a meditation in which we come into conscious union with God. We come into an actual experience of oneness, at one moment. Then that our work has been fulfilled, our mission has been fulfilled, and then we are enabled to live the life that Paul revealed. I live, yet not I. It is the Christ that is living my life. I'm a witness now to the Christ that is living my life. I am a beholder of its glory and of its function. And in relaxing from conscious effort, struggle, might, power, concern, worry, fear, the glory of God can be made manifest through my personal life so that all men may witness it and say, ah, yes, when God is come, when the Spirit of God is come to individual life, it is a life of glory, of service. No one's life becomes glorified that he may just go through life on cloud nine. One's life is glorified that it may be a service and a dedication to the Creator of all, the Spirit of God that dwelleth in us. Thank you. Thank you until, I hope, next Sunday morning.